You're listening to the Living Outside the Box podcast with JR and Kayla Cox, where we talk about living life more simply and on your terms. Today's episode is an interview with Marilyn Wilson, who's a speaker and author of two books, Life Outside the Box and The Wisdom of Listening. We hope you enjoy it. Marilyn, thank you for joining us. Uh, If you can, can you take a moment to introduce yourself and kind of just tell us a little bit about uh, what you do? Uh, My name is Marilyn Wilson. Um, I am a freelance writer. I am a published author of two Amazon bestselling books. I am a speaker. I do author support for my publisher. And I also do social media support for three companies. So I've got my fingers in a lot of pies, but my main focus is writing and speaking right now. Very cool. And and I, I read a little bit on your website about how you kind of got started into the, the writing, but can you go through that uh, that story, like how it all came about? I love telling this story. It's probably my favorite story. I get goosebumps every time I tell it. So I was home with the kids for 15 years. Um, part of that is the cost of daycare. and Part of that was a severe bullying situation. My kids were not safe. And at the point we reached, they reached mid high school. They were really ready for me to take a step back. And so I needed to find something to do. So I went on an online service called Craigslist. I don't know if you're familiar with it and started perusing the job opportunities. And there was, I'd always kind of thought about writing when I was young. I didn't know what that meant, but there was a category for writing. And in it was an ad from a fashion magazine in New York looking for submissions. And being ADD and totally impulsive, I thought, well, how can this be? And just fired off three story ideas. I really knew nothing about fashion. I was aware of a couple local um, designers that I could I could wrap a story around. So honestly, no one was more surprised than me, not only that two were accepted. And a year and a half later, seriously, no one was more surprised than me when I fell into co-owning, running and editing a magazine of our own locally. So it's it's one of those leap of faith. It was really tough. I had to learn everything while doing in the public eye. Lots of tears. Um, (laughs) But in the end, what kept me at it was from the first moment I sat down to interview, I had goosebumps from head to toe. I've always been fascinated by people always and their stories and how different we are and i sat through that first interview going this is it this is my passion this is what i have to do so despite the difficult times that lay ahead my eye was on the prize i wanted to keep interviewing and to keep interviewing i had to write so i figured it out (laughs) and for those who don't know that was in my 50s So I answered that ad at 50. So I was starting a whole new career, a whole new direction with absolutely no resume, no school or no knowledge of the subject. I just literally out of passion dove in and did what it took. Wow. Was that the was that the first instance in your life that you that you kind of did that where you said, I'm just going to go for this and, and see how it turns out? You know, I've always been impulsive and I've always Uh been a leaper, but I think this is the first time I leaped in that deep a stormy of water. I I mean, I was seriously, seriously over my head. I've I've had a few other times I dove into uh, dance costuming without even knowing how to do it other than basic (laughs) sewing. That was very stressful as well. Um, I, I dive into a lot of things when it feels right, but the writing within a two year period took me so far over my head. And I think as somebody who grew up fairly insecure and I still struggle with with self-esteem and follow through, um, doing it all in the public eye was the challenge. I mean, if I had not been so passionate about interviewing, if I hadn't so wanted to keep hearing people's stories, I wouldn't have survived. Um, right. There was even a day I just collapsed on the bathroom floor. I was exhausted. I was overwhelmed. I didn't know what to do. But I think walking through those tough times also makes when you get to the end, the journey so much sweeter. I launched my first book five days after turning 60, a whole decade after I started this journey. And just stepping on that stage and looking at the friends. I had 150 people there. We had a big party. And looking at the support I'd received and knowing how hard this was and how many people held me up 
that I had to lean on to get there, there's the harder the journey, the more satisfaction at the end. I really had to pat myself for the first time. I didn't make excuses. Oh, that's okay. So and so helped me. I actually patted myself on the back for getting there because I knew how much it cost me emotionally. And uh, it, it's gotten easier, but it's never easy. Everything I do is putting myself out there in the public eye. And when you grew up kind of not fitting into the box that you were you were given to fit into, that's always an uncomfortable place for me. I always have to stop and breathe and say, it's okay, Marilyn, you, you've done this, you know where you're going. Right. So that, that time that you said that you were on the, on the floor, just kind of overwhelmed, exhausted, what, what pulled you back, back to, to being able to go again, to continue on? I don't know. Don't know? I mean, I, I'm lucky I have a wonderful husband. He found me. Oh. He just put a blanket over me and gave me the phone. I actually had a part-time job that I, I called in sick to, and I he just left me alone and let me lay there and think my way through it. Right. What What is it? You know, if I wasn't such a leaper and so impulsive, um, when I make these decisions, I think I'd be a little better prepared for what it meant or how to go through it. Instead, I just run through it like a bull. So mm -hmm. um, as I get older and as I continue to take on new challenges, which I love, um, I've tried to be more careful about not taking on too much and understanding right. what an appropriate step was. So it was a real learning experience for me, but it just fell into my lap and I just had to hold on tight and go. So sometimes I guess you just have to, when you're overwhelmed, stop and do some self-care. You have to stop and, and let the feelings out and figure out what it means. And do you want to continue? How can you continue and have it not? First thing I did was quit my part-time job. Best thing I ever did. Mm -hmm. I was I was overstretched. And a year and a half later, I folded the magazine because it just was becoming too much and turned my attention. I almost quit writing at that point. I, I And I gave myself six weeks to think about it. And that's the point I moved into books um, because I could do them at home at my own pace. Um, it's just a better situation for me, but I don't regret the journey to that point. Um, and I'm sorry I wasn't able to give myself permission to step back earlier when I was really starting to get overwhelmed and say, what does this mean? Do I want to continue this way? If so, how will I get through it? So, I mean, your body is pretty in your heart, tell you. And sometimes right. we just don't listen because we're so caught up in what we're doing and we're so excited about what we're doing that we quit forgetting. And, and, and as you get older, you, you learn, you have to stop and start listening to your what your body's telling you and your mind is telling you and and make time for self-care. That was, right. it was a hard lesson, but it's one I know now. Every time I get overwhelmed, I pull back, I take a couple days off, I stop and I think about what it means and what do I want to do? Am I headed the right direction? And that's been a really helpful tool for me right it's yeah it's good to be able to to identify the things that are uh, necessary for you to continue to do for your own uh, the your own benefit and then those other things that you're doing uh, based on the shoulds around you what you think you should be doing but but ultimately aren't the best so, I, I, I want to respond really quickly to the real word should because uh, I lived with should all my life right and I think we as people need to understand what serves us at one per point doesn't. So I launched a magazine with somebody. Within 18 months, we had 150,000 hits a month. It was hideously successful. Uh -huh. And we weren't making money because we didn't have anybody to handle that. So right. I should take this to its conclusion. I should find a buyer. I should not let this thing fail. I should stick this out because look what I've done. I can't walk away from all that work. And the truth of the matter was I need to walk away from that to look for the next thing in my life. So we, I always feel like the word should holds us to what we've been doing. Mm -hmm. And the truth of the matter is we weren't raised this way, but you are allowed many times through your life to find a new passion. And and you're mm -hmm. traveling the road. You should know that. What did you walk right. away from and let go to, to have this fabulous life you have now? And when this life doesn't serve you anymore, there is no should. You get to just walk away and pick something new. So I just should is a big word for me. I, I, I Because I can hear it in the back of my mind. I should do this. No, I shouldn't. Right. I just need to listen and and make the right step whatever feels good at the time so. right we 
we uh kayla heard that um, on a podcast some time ago about should shooting all over yourself and uh, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> we, right so we said we want to whatever decisions that we make from from that point on to be things that we can can walk away from uh, and not feel resentment about other people kind of well we say forcing us to do that thing but really it's just yeah. us saying that we should do this and we said no more. We can't say that anymore. We've got to stop saying you should. You should. We got to do what's best for us. When you put out inspirational books, the first thing you learn is that people have an expectation of who I should be now. Mm -hmm. I'm not anybody. I'm just like everybody else. I'm just sharing my journey and walking through life the best way I can. And people get disappointed. It's not easy to bear sometimes. But should. Should is just a word I wish I could delete from the vocabulary. Right, absolutely. We agree with that. So you uh, you had put your first book out uh, 10 years after you started writing, you said? Yes. Um, so you had been doing interviews during that 10 years. Is that what that was all about? I interviewed over 150 people around the world. I did most of those for my local magazine. We featured people working in our community in different areas of fashion. So I would tell a bit of their story, how they got what they were doing and what their job was now. Um, I also worked with Rain Magazine in New York and they gave me a lot of freedom. I even covered Sandcastle, competitive Sandcastle builders for them. And I did a couple artists articles for um, a magazine in London on artists and photographers. They had a different focus. So. It was always just finding a place to land these interviews, and I didn't always always find them. But a lot of it was done for my either myself or for the magazine in New York. I contributed um, two articles per issue to that one, and I did a small article for a dance magazine. And um, yeah, so yeah, it was it, it was short and to the point. Did the interview? You transcribed it. You pounded out anywhere from eight hundred to twelve hundred words, and you sent it off. But it wasn't. I mean, my passion has always been um, people's journeys. How did mm -hmm. you get from where you were? Because I struggled. I struggled all my life. So it was enlightening to me to learn how other people navigated that difficult course. What brought you to where you were? What was hard? What was easy? How do you cope? Like you asked me, how did I cope in that moment? Mm -hmm. And so that's always been my passion. So the move to books didn't come because I sort of chose it. It's because the door to magazines closed. It just right. closed. It closed decisively with my own. And at that point, I did that self-care. I stepped back and I said, am I enjoying magazine articles anymore? And the answer was no. What does that mean? Do I stop? And that was a serious consideration. I really did consider stopping and, and going in a new new direction. And so I made a, a pact. I said, I'm going to, I had set up a blog for no reason at that point. And I said, I'm going to write something on my blog every day for six weeks. Because really interviewing is my passion, not, not writing. So we'll see at the end of six weeks how I feel about it. And I enjoyed myself immensely. And I said, okay, there's something there. And it took another four or five months before I met the publisher. But I really was kind of in a drift with my writing for almost nine months, not knowing where I would head next, waiting for the right door to open. So sometimes it's just time. You just right. have to give it time. The opportunities open when they're meant to and um, being impatient or for forcing it doesn't work. And for me, that's certainly been the case. Um, so, I get that. People said, where do the, your interviews come from? They come. They just come mm -hmm. into my life. We're at the right time, suddenly I'm next to somebody, somebody says something, and I'm off on a trail, whether it's them or somebody else. It's it's just such a, a door opens and you walk in it. You just have to be really aware around you of what's happening and patient. Right, right. That's what I was going to ask is uh, for, for your book with the uh, Life Outside the Box, the uh, the interviews, were they, the, they mostly just came from your experiences in life or were they people that you met through doing interviews for the magazine articles? So I think I, I, you're asking me to go back a little bit. There's 10 interviews in there. And my assumption when I started this was I had 150 interviews. I go and pick 10 I thought went together. Mm -hmm. um, my problem was so many were in the world of fashion and I didn't want it to be a fashion book. Right. So what I did was come up because I'd done some other stuff for Rain Magazine, I picked 
10 that I'd done between Rain Magazine, between the magazine in, in London and the ones for mine, um, I picked seven that seemed to be really diverse. And then I looked at those and I said, what would it take to fill in this book? So seven of them I had interviewed before, um, three I added for the book, and the three I added were a spoken word poet that that really hit the, the big time when he did a, a piece on bullying. Mm -hmm. And my kids were bullied quite bad, so I was really touched by that. So I added him. I added my publisher who had walked away from her husband in a job in London and lived on boats for seven years and ended up in Canada uh, founding a publishing company. I thought that was a very, very dramatic change of directions. And the third one I added was a local woman who founded a, a charity called um, Beauty Night Society. And they go into the poor parts of town. Here it's called the Downtown East Side. And they provide um, beauty services for these women. They go in, they can get their hair washed and curled. They can, they can get help with anything. They have people come in that do, um, they have to be careful because you really can't touch them because of the abuse they're under, but they try to make them feel good about themselves by offering them services that they want. And so mm. I thought that was a fascinating story too. So in the end, I felt like the 10 chosen, so the seven I had done before and the three I added in, had that mix of people that were born rich, people that were born into poverty, people that had money, people that were were struggling to put food on the table. Um, it had a mix of people all living the life of their choosing without apology and all defining success differently. And that's what I wanted it to be. That was the whole point of the book because that's what changed my view of my journey. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so I was lucky seven. I thought I'd have all 10 there and I didn't. I got to number seven and I went, something's missing and you just have to sit back and give it time. And, and it became clear what was missing and what needed to go in. I expect right. that. I want to do more. I've got like 25 interviews sitting here to do two more books. And I bet you the same thing happens. I bet you I pick seven or eight and go, okay, the story's not complete. I need one more facet of the diamond to, to make the picture more diverse. Right, right. So uh, out throughout all of the, the interviewing that you've done, has there been a, a favorite interview or a favorite lesson pulled from one of the interviewees? Oh, there's so many good ones. <laughs> um, the first one that really, a concept somebody handed me that hit me between the eyes was called, um, he called it wabasabi. Somebody's has disagreed with that recently, but it was the Japanese um, idea of finding beauty and imperfection. So if you have a beautiful bowl that gets a crack, you fill the crack with gold. And it's a celebration of living and dying and decay and, and the normal processes of life. And it was an inspiration for a photographer, but for me, I mean, there were those goosebumps. And I came home and I was always been told I needed to change. That, that, that I wasn't acceptable the way I was. So the idea that my rough spots that people weren't happy with were maybe part of my beauty right. was really eye-opening, really, really eye-opening. And I walked around with that for a long time. Um, I can't remember what somebody said one time, but I came to, they just said, you know, you're really good at interviewing. And I thought, you know, I'm good at interviewing for those same lumps and bumps, you know, the racing mind, the intensity, the overly curious, the, the lack of patience, all those things really actually work for me in interviews. So I said, okay, maybe they're not my beauty. Maybe they're my talents. Maybe I just didn't know how to use them until now. Right. Another really profound moment early on was um, I was talking with a Zen chaplain um, about her life and her charity, and she threw out the idea of Ujamaa. And Ujamaa is a day in Kwanzaa, and it's about cooperative economics where the village comes together as a whole to raise each other up equally. Mm -hmm. And I got to thinking about that, and I had noticed that once I started feeling better about who I was, the people around me were treating me differently. Right. When I mm. thought I was broken, I seemed to have people around who also thought I was broken. And as soon as I was more accepting of myself, I seemed to have people around me that were more accepting. So I made a decision to consciously watch as people came into my life and look 
for relationships, even business relationships, where I felt that sense of coming together to raise each other up, where I didn't feel right. in competition, where I felt they could offer me really acceptance and support for who I was, and I could offer them exactly the same. Um, just the lack of negativity. And that concept really changed my life. And to pursue it, like I'm not rabid about it, but I do. I'm very conscious as I talk to people and meet people, and I'm very sensitive to those that I feel very safe with and that I'm intrigued and feel like I can offer them something to support their journey too. And I really make an effort to nurture those relationships. Mm -hmm. And when business opportunities come my way, I use that same principle. Do I feel like we have similar goals? Do we operate with the same morals? Does it feel like I'm, I'll am i be an asset to them and they can be an asset to me? And if not, I walk away. You do right. not have to take every opportunity. So those were the first two. There's been so many great things, but those were the first two. And if I have time, I'd like to share one more because it relates to my second book. Absolutely. Um, um, this is mentioned in my first book, though. It's the chapter on Pamela Masek, who is a fine artist. She grew up in violence and poverty and really struggled when she made the decision to be an artist. She said that she would hold her hand at the canvas shaking, absolutely mm -hmm. sure that she'd make a mistake, just very frightened. And over time, she found that art was a piece of gold in her pocket that she could share with others to help them heal. It was helping her heal and she could share it with others. And so that's the concept of my second book, which is here's all the pieces of gold handed me that I have to share with others. And I always say when I go into a room now, I look around and see who attracts my eye and I go talk to them. I'm wondering if I'm gonna share a piece of gold with them or if they got something in their pocket for me that I need at this moment in time. We're just surrounded by wisdom. We're surrounded right. by wisdom. And we always think it's the person on stage who's going to give it to us or the, the okay. expert in the book. And no, I have gotten pieces of wisdom on the subway in New York. People have deep pockets. And if you just take a chance and open a conversation. So those are kind of my trifecta, I think. Those three things are probably the most important things I've learned um, in interviewing. Yeah. And I'm so grateful for them. Right. One of the things you said reminded me of a quote, and Kayla have, may have to tell me who said it, but it's it's basically surround yourself with people who want what's best for you or or who you feel want what's best for you. And then you do the same for them. And it's just a, a cohesive relationships that you can so, that you can have in life. So I'm telling Kayla, open the book uh, on the on the wisdom of listening and read the chapter on Ujama because that's exactly what it is. Mutually supportive common goals, accepting people the way they are, taking your turns on stage. Those are the relationships that, that move us forward and help us hold on to that self-esteem and help us, help us keep embracing our unique journey and push us forward. It's so easy to have a few bad experiences and, and want to hold back. I, I Even before I launched this second book, I had to ask myself, do I want to really put myself out there like this, there's going to be a target on my back. There's going to be right. expectations. This is really raw. And the truth was the answer was yes, but but I'm not excited about it every day. I'm always mm -hmm. a little nervous that, that um, there will be something coming my way, expectations that I can't fulfill. Right, right. Uh, so so over in this in this life of uh, kind of living your own path, choosing your own way to go, um, what what do you think is the biggest advantage of that kind of life, and then also the biggest disadvantage? Mm, that's a really good question. I'm so glad you're talking to me. Um, <laughs> the biggest advantage is is that just being present in the moment and and open to the opportunities that are meant to be for you leads you to both your passion and it leads you to do purpose. Mm -hmm. There there are no mistakes. Everybody is here for a reason. I believe that deeply and it's a path only you can walk. And so taping that leap of faith, even with the difficulties that followed, led me to my not only my passion, but my purpose. I feel so grounded and so solid in who I am. I know what I'm meant to do. And 
after drifting for so many years, it feels really good. Um, the negative is you're not going to make everybody happy. And right. if you're like me and, and, you know, I know you're aware I had an issue this morning even. Um, if you're like me, those moments are not hard. It's, it's I am a disappointment to my relatives. Mm. I'm a good person, but I'm a, because they have such strong beliefs that I cannot fulfill. And it took me till I was 50 to give myself permission to not hide and to walk the path I meant to lead because I didn't right. want to disappoint my family. I don't want to disappoint my children or my husband or um, so. So the positive is simply that you there is a joy and a peace that comes from knowing your purpose and understanding your passion and allowing yourself to fulfill those. Um, and the negative is just that you're not going to make people happy. There's going to be people that that are not happy about what you're doing, and and that's not a joyful thing, either, you know. Right. I don't I don't know how else to say it, but it it does take a little bit of courage, and it really, really takes being solid in yourself. You really need to know that this is what you've been guided to do. Right, and and it's it's almost as as saying in order to help the people that are going to get help from you, you may have to not necessarily hurt others, but it, understand that they're not going to feel the same way about about you that you think you should be felt about if I'm making myself clear. No, no, you, you, you're you perfectly clear. And what I had to accept, this is, I have a mentor that's wonderful, is I am not hurting others. Mm -hmm. They are choosing to be hurt. And I have to let go of that. That's, that's a reflection on them. And it's a reflection on their journey and it's not so no matter how uncomfortable that is for me um, that's something that's not going to change i've had to let a little of my extended family go for a little bit it's not like they're out of my life but i just needed a break because right. i need to to move forward right now in a way that they're that they may not be happy with or it it's 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 not easy and it's not always comfortable but after this 10 year journey, well, it's 12 years now and writing two books, especially the second book that really kind of gave me clarity on all I've gone through. Um, I know what I mean. I'm speaking tomorrow and I'm actually nervous about it. I really don't need to be, but I'm nervous about it because I care so much that that I give them these pieces of gold. I just feel um, I want to help them come to the place I am. It's all about them. So. Uh, yeah, so there's your up and down. One is is peace and joy and the satisfaction of fulfilling your purpose and finding your passion. And the downside is is it's not going to make people happy. You're going to have people you care about that are not happy. And you have to accept that and recognize that that is their choice. It's not what you're doing to them. It's their choice. Right. And that, that takes a little work some days because I really do care about my friends and relatives very much. Yeah. Well, I, I love your, your mantra. I'm not hurting others. They're choosing to be hurt. Yeah. Um, uh, before we wrap up, Marilyn, is there anything that I didn't ask you that, that you think I should have? Or is there anything that you'd like to add? Wow. Um, I think I just want to encourage everybody that is struggling with self-love and self-doubt. And I just want to remind them, even though I've always already said this, is that there are no mistakes you are exactly who you're meant to be. You're not expected to change and you're not expected to walk, live in a box of somebody else's choosing. You can choose to walk the path that feels right for you and you can do it without apology. Um, if you're struggling, you can find me through my website at www.marilynrwilson.com. If you need to reach out, I've got some great resources. Uh, my mentor has some videos of reading her book on YouTube. There's a lot of resources I can, I can send to you, but just be kind to yourself today and just give yourself a break and, and take time. It takes time to make changes. You know, just try to be in the moment and breathe and know. I mean, if you forget, just think of my voice now. You are who you meant to be. I believe in you and I know you have a purpose. 
Well, thank you, Marilyn. I appreciate it so much. We've got a lot of wisdom out of this. And is the website MarilynRWilson.com the best way for people to connect with you? Yeah, there's a Gmail address on there that's the best way to reach me. You can okay. also find me. I've got a professional page on Facebook and I've got an Instagram account, but I don't really look at emails from Instagram. So you right. can find my professional page on Facebook. Same thing, Marilyn R. Wilson writer, I think. Um, you can reach out to me through there or through my Gmail account. If, if you need resources or you need some support in this area, that's my mission. That's what I do one person at a time. Thanks again for joining us on the Living Outside the Box podcast. Please be sure to head over to your favorite podcast player and subscribe and leave a review. This podcast is brought to you by our Slow and Steady Success Academy, an online school designed to help you achieve your goals by implementing sustainable lifestyle changes. Grab your all-access pass to gain monthly access to all the courses as they become available, as well as our private members-only Facebook group. The link